when you see uh, where the technology is today, um, do you believe that we are close or far from uh, kind of moving off planet? I think our curiosity is a huge driving force to get out of that. And then we believe we are kind of smart enough to develop all the technology. And then nowadays a lot of the commercial space comes up and then a lot of diverse ideas and way to go over there. And then I could feel every day from the small little kids who want to be a rocket scientist and then always ask me, do you believe there out there is alien or something? And then I really want to answer correctly, but I don't know yet. <laughs> that is so, the correct answer. Yeah. <laughs> and then even if we don't have any evidence, I cannot tell there's none because we don't know yet. And even if we could feel like, but I cannot tell as an engineer, I couldn't say yes. So i really wondering about it and I really admire all those people who are working on it. And then hopefully I can go there and shave, wave your hands and say hello for all of us. Excellent. All right, so what I'm going to do is just ask a question of each of you uh, to set the stage and then we'll totally open it up to everybody else. Uh, Jill, uh, the, the Fermi paradox, uh, can you describe it to the folks and where, what is your position on the Fermi paradox? The Fermi paradox can be summarized as if there ever was anywhere and any when a technological civilization other than ours, then in a time that, um, that is very short, they would obviously develop the ability for interstellar travel and they would obviously colonize the galaxy. No matter what your model is, it would take place in a time that's short compared to the lifetime of the galaxy. But they're not here. Therefore, given the structure of the paradox, there can't have been any technology anywhere and anywhere before us. We're the first. So that whole logical structure revolves around your ability to say they're not here. And I don't think we can say that. I don't think that we have explored even our own backyard, the solar system, well enough to rule out the possibility of alien technology being there. I mean, we're really working very hard to find one kilometer rocks out there that might have our name on it. Um, littler things are much harder to find. So I don't think that they're here abducting Aunt Alice off the streets of New York for salacious medical experiments. I don't think that. <laughs> there's, no, there's no evidence for that. But we really haven't looked, either physically or looking for signals. We haven't hardly begun our SETI search. All that we've been able to do in 50 years is numerically equivalent to kind of scooping one eight ounce glass out of the world's oceans and looking and saying, huh, well, no fish in there. I guess there are no fish in the ocean. <laughs> That's where we are. Exponential technology is going to get us much farther, much faster, and I'm really excited about the potentials. Mm. But I'm, my answer to the Fermi paradox is how should we know? We just haven't looked yet. Uh, we kind of discussed this ad hoc at Singularity, and there's quite a lot of different opinions. Ray thinks that he does, we, we must be the most advanced just because if you have exponential technologies, you should get to intergalactic or interstellar travel fairly quickly, and so why do we not see them? Uh, Peter has the opposite view that there must be tons out there, we, haven't, we just haven't found it. Uh, and then there's the transcension hypothesis uh, from John Smart that says, well, when you get sophisticated enough, you put on virtual reality and you just stay where you are imagining so you don't need to go anywhere anywhere, so that's why we don't, we don't, we don't see them. And so uh, we'll ask for a poll at the end where you think you might be. Um, Alex, the, uh, one of the guiding uh, uh, kind of framing of my thinking around this was a course in astrophysics where they talked about the Drake equation, yeah. um, which is the, maybe you can describe that in, in, in your opinion. Uh, what's the, is the probability increasing as, or decreasing as we uh, discover more and more capable, uh, yeah. stars out there and planets? So the, the Drake equation is, is a way of guesstimating how many communicating intelligent civilizations there might be at the present time in our Milky Way galaxy, rather than just saying, oh, there are three, or there are four billion, or pi, or whatever, you know. It's uh, analogous to estimating the number of perfect bookstores in your city. The number of per perfect bookstores depends on which kinds of books you like and how far away you are willing to go and what the hours of operation are. 
and things like that, and, and very importantly, the lifetime of a bookstore, and also the rate at which new bookstores form. So you can then guesstimate how many there are, and it's better than just coming up with a number. So it turns out that the astrophysical factors are now pretty well known. We know that there's planets around nearly every star, and there's a potentially habitable planet around one in five stars, et cetera, et cetera. The, the biological factors are much less well known, okay? We, we really don't know how life arises. So if the probability is very, very low that life arises, and if the probability is very, very low that given primitive life, it involves to intelligence, and then finally to a communicative ability, um, then you can easily multiply these factors together and instead of getting you know, 100,000 communicating civilizations in the Milky Way, like what Carl Sagan got some decades ago, you can, taking the most pessimistic view, you could easily conclude that we are the only ones in our observable universe. I mean, I, I've taken the pessimistic numbers and I multiply it together. And, and you know, yes, there, there's 100 billion galaxies out there and 10 to 100 billion stars per galaxy, and that's a lot of stars. But if, they're, if you're multiplying by the reciprocal of an even bigger number, then the probability is going to be less than unity. And it's conceivable that we're the only ones in the observable universe. Now, having said that, my own view is that sort of in the middle of the road, I don't think uh, there are many in our galaxy. I think that there may well be quite a few in the observable universe because I think that we come about as a result of a random process that does eventually occur somewhere else. But my own view is, is reasonably pessimistic, actually, about mechanically able, intelligent civilizations that are, that are able to, to communicate and much less able to, to travel and colonize the galaxy. And so my solution to the Fermi paradox is that, you know, we're not alone, but we may be alone in our Milky Way or one of very few. And if there were other ones in the past, it's conceivable that intelligence and mechanical ability at our level always comes or nearly always comes with a tendency towards self-destruction, which we clearly have as homo sapiens. And so if that's the case, then intelligent, mechanically able civilizations could be like flash bulbs in the night of the Milky Way galaxy. And so they're just, they, they just extinguish themselves before they've had a chance to go out and colonize the galaxy. <laughs> okay. Uh, one quick question before I open it up. The elephant in the room is the uh, this discovery of a signal over the last few days. Uh, seems unlikely. Can you give us your framing and context for it? Okay, so there has been the announcement actually came out Saturday morning of the detection of a candidate SETI signal from uh, the vicinity of a star called HD 164595. It's a star oh, like that, the sun. Oh, that one. Yeah. yeah, that one. <laughs> it's a star like the sun. It's a little over 90 light years away. Um, but as Kepler has told us, it has, the Kepler mission has schooled us exquisitely in the importance of that word candidate, mm. right? And for something to go from being a Kepler object of interest to being a candidate, it has to go through an enormous number of validations and other tests and prove me wrong kinds of um, analyses. This is the detection of a signal from a Russian telescope that was seen once for two seconds uh, out of the 39 times that the telescope looked in the direction of that star. It wasn't followed up on immediately. No one else was asked to look at it until now, more than a year later, and um, you know, it's just, you don't know what to do with that. Mm. Uh, it's, we've seen once and not seen again. So I really feel like I just have to get another t-shirt made with my lifelong mantra that one telescope is not enough for SETI. <laughs> mm -hmm. And an array is even better. So um, we have to treat it as something that's interesting. We're spending some telescope time looking at it. Um, I wish they'd spent more of their time trying to verify it before they made this big play to the world. It's a candidate signal, and it really isn't a very strong candidate because it hasn't passed any other tests. Got it. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, we'll go there and then here. Yes, ma'am. Boundary is expanding faster 
Yeah, so I can address that. Um, Quick question. Did everybody in the back hear the question? No. Can you I'll, repeat? I'll summarize it. I'll, I'll try to. I mean, the universe is, is, is expanding, uh, and, and the question regards the boundary of this expanding universe and how light can basically cross it, right? Am I understanding your question? So let me, let me just say something, because um, it, it turns out that this is kind of a, a tricky concept, but we think our universe has no boundary, no physical boundary. It's either infinite or it wraps around itself like a balloon. And think of the, the balloon as being a hypothetical universe where the rubber are the only dimensions you can travel along, forward and backward, left and right, any combination of those two motions, but in and out are not allowed, okay? So, so that's, a, that's a finite universe, but it has no boundary. There's no edge off of which you can fall. All right. So in a similar way, we live either in an infinite universe or one that wraps around. And so, in fact, there is no physical boundary. There's an, obs there's an observational boundary. There's a, a particle horizon or a light horizon. And that's simply the distance from which, say, light could have reached us. All right. But we have good reasons to think that the universe extends far beyond the parts from which light could have reached us. And they're just parts that, you know, the light is on its way and it either will reach us or it won't. In an accelerating universe, more likely than not, it won't. But in a decelerating universe, it will. And then there are other parts that are near our observable boundary, and they have their own boundary, which is far beyond our boundary. Okay, so, so in a sense, the answer to your question is that it's not a fair question because there, there is no boundary. Okay. Uh, nicely, nicely sidestepped. Uh, we'll go here, here, and then back there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Stuff, yeah. Well, so, the, so the question is, uh, does anybody uh, consider that we're uh, not really from Earth, that we're seeded or something else like that? Now, actually, that idea started with uh, Sven Arrhenius, a Swedish um, scientist, quite a while ago. The it, general term is panspermia, that life is spread um, from some other place to Earth. Uh, an Occam's razor kind of answer is that it doesn't seem to be necessary for life on Earth. What we don't, we can't tell you how life started. Some people are trying to make it in a test tube. They're actually getting pretty close. Uh, but it that seems like uh, just putting the the question off at a distance. Now, the fact that life might travel from one body to another within our solar system is something that we take very very seriously because we want to explore Mars. We want to look at other bodies in the solar system for evidence of extinct or extant life. And if we find life on Mars particularly, that's not enough. We have to ask another question. We have to say, is that life us or are we Martians? Because early in the history of the solar system, Rocks were exchanged among the terrestrial planets. Things were banging into one another, and rocks were being exploded off the surface of one planet, Mars, for example, landing on the surface of the Earth. In our asteroid, uh, I'm sorry, in our meteorite collections, we have bits of the Moon and Mars that we have collected. So it is possible that life um, went in one or the other direction. More probable that it comes here because we have a deeper gravitational well than for terrestrial life to go to Mars. So if we find life on Mars, we're going to have to say, are we related? And we take it quite seriously. We also want to make sure that we don't bring the life that we find. That would be bad. It wouldn't be a very good scientific experiment. And, and uh, so the... Um, N of, N of 2 is really important in this whole game. A second genesis in this one solar system will tell you that life is ubiquitous. A second, um, I, so this is where I might disagree with you, a second evidence of technology. Yep. Finding somebody else would tell you that there are lots. So you... And as a point of view, the person who would be in just a little bit outside of the Earth, <laughs> and I realize that even if I don't know if we are originally from Earth or not, but I'm pretty sure 
we are adapted in this environment for certain a long time. And I realized that really, really inconvenient, just 200 miles above. And I realized, oh my God, we are totally optimized for this planet. So if some other organism is out there, they would look a totally different view because gravity make us like this. And then a lot of the gas make us like that. And then once I go up, I don't need a muscle, I don't need a bone. And then during that time, I'm thinking about, oh my God, if there's a other intelligence in other planet with totally different environment, they would look like totally different of us. So that's my yeah, idea. Uh, Jill, just to follow up on that, um, you know, we, uh, as we we're trying to observe uh, uh, life forms or detect intelligence, is the basic theory that uh, you should have gotten to radio wave um, intelligence, uh, however the f evolution form was, uh, how do you think about the idea that some other intelligence may broadcast some totally different frequency and we don't know what we don't know? Right. Do, you, do you try and mitigate for that or compensate for that? Or um, has singularity? university figured out a way to do what we can't conceive of? I'd love to know it. <laughs> I mean, basically, we're stuck, I think, I think, with the technology of the 21st century. We're it good, might, we're not that good. No, yeah, <laughs> it, it might not be right. We could be exquisitely doing the wrong thing, but then the only game in town is to stay around long enough to evolve, to get smart enough to figure out what the right game is and start mm -hmm. doing that. Got it. Questions, sir, there. Alex, do you want to take that? Well, yeah, the question is basically about advanced telescopes detecting additional exoplanets. Yeah, you know, the, the bigger they are, the better. In space is better. Using interferometric techniques is better. There are many plans in the works. The J James W. Webb, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to hopefully find atmospheres and stuff. Um, I don't want to address any specific particular telescope too much right now because I don't necessarily know a lot about it, but a, a lot of astronomers are thinking about, about ways to detect exoplanets better. And for example, on the Gemini eight meter telescopes, my colleague James Graham at Berkeley has built this instrument called GPI, and it basically has a very, very high contrast ratio to try to detect things that are one billionth or one tenth billionth of the brightness of the star closer into the star than was the case in the images I showed. So yeah, pe people are working on these kinds of things. But there are many techniques that are revealing many, many exoplanets. There are clearly a lot of planets in our solar system, so there are a lot of potential places to have life. The question really is more, you know, does life arise, because there are plenty of places for it to arise, and does intelligence evolve? And, and if so, does it then go on and, and destroy itself inevitably or almost inevitably? Yeah, the image, I mean, so the imaging, there were, there were plans in NASA some time ago, um, the terrestrial planet finder, right, that got canned because these things become really expensive. But, you know, with, with this exoplanet being found around Proxima Centauri and other advances in the field, this might actually kickstart some of these uh, plans back. It's just that it's expensive and the, and the discretionary part of the federal research budget is uh, very small, you know, right? So... Yeah, actually, the NASA charts have begun to have a placeholder called Louvoir 
the uh -huh. large ultraviolet optical infrared telescope for doing this kind of thing. And we don't know how to do it, and we don't know what wavelength we do it in. Uh, but we're at least yeah. thinking about it. And since this is Singularity University, right? Come on. <laughs> People are starting to talk about if you could take your telescope and put it 550 astronomical units away, 550 times farther away than we are from the sun, then you can use the sun as a gravitational lens. Mm -hmm. And man, do you get magnification of any point that's just right on the line behind the sun and you. Um, we'll we'll get right on that. It's a little hard to steer that telescope. <laughs> okay. uh, question here. Just shout it out and we'll repeat the question. Sir, just re we'll, we'll repeat the question. So you have to make it brief. So, so as far as I know, Stephen Hawking uh, came to the personal conclusion that if there were an extraterrestrial uh, life on the intelligence, there are good chance that they would be evolved. And his advice is to hide or send. Uh, so what do you think of that? Um, could it be an answer to the Fermi paradox in case of other, other intelligence came to the same conclusion on his hiding concept? Yes. Um, Stephen Hawking is a brilliant individual. And the question here is, Stephen Hawking is, is well known for saying, uh, we better not um, make ourselves visible because it didn't work out very well for the natives when Columbus landed in the New World, right? <laughs> well, now think about that. Um, first of all, they have to get here. Mm -hmm. If they can get here, they're writing the rules because they have a technology that's significantly in advance of what we have. Um, but I actually think there's another interpretation that has to do with this longevity. And your pessimism about technology is self-destructive. There's also another way of looking at like that. If they can last long enough to build up the technology to get here, then perhaps um, they've managed to evolve beyond the aggression that got us to where we are today. And Steven Pinker has a book which points out that today, although it doesn't seem like it, we are statistically kinder and gentler than we've ever been in the past, and that this is a cultural evolution. So if that sort of thing goes on, and if you can't get to be old unless you stop being sons of bitches, right, and, and get your act together and manage your planet constructively um, so that you can get to be old and have the technology to show up here on our doorstep, um, if that's a scenario that plays out, then maybe we don't have to worry so much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question, uh, Anita, go ahead, and then we'll go there and then there. Yeah. I have no idea what you're oh, asking. It's kind of hard. <laughs> um, are you asking, is there a philosophy of how we think about space? No, what's the philosophy discussion? I know anytime we talk about space, science, technology, we get into the science, mathematics models. But is there even a conversation that happens just from the philosophy of like philosophy of curiosity, philosophy of exploration, philosophy, and is there something related to space in general? Okay. Because you're pursuing that philosophy. Easy way of thinking about it. why did you go into space? Because I wonder what happened over there, and I really want to bring something over there and then try it if it works or not. And then I test my body also. I grew up and throw up <laughs> and, <laughs> and losing my muscle, and then all those testing. And then I myself make myself as a guinea pig to try out. And then I like the word philosophy, and then and thinking like. Yeah, today I got an interview with the BBC and she asked me about how do you think about colonization in the future in the space. And then I told her, for us, colonization would be look cool, but what if somebody live over there? 
and that is a huge disaster. So we should preserve the ecosystem over there. Of course, they would understand our curiosity, but we should find a balance between two. Even if we don't know nobody's over there, once we arrive there, there's a really little tiny people over there. Oops, we step on them, and then there's a huge scrub for them. So I think philosophy is really, really important on top of the science and technology, but, uh, but until the time we will find out if there is really something over there or not. Okay. There uh, is I'm a discipline called meta law that begins to try and address some of the questions you're talking about. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. We've run out of time. I do have one request. Uh, are you going back up into space sometime? Uh, really want to do it. But okay. for doing that, government policy will change and make money for the budget, and then so I should vote for the right politician. If, <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if you do get back up to space, I have a request. At some point when the camera's on you, start screaming and pointing off camera and going, oh my God, what the hell is that thing? And just watch the world go crazy. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much, Jill, Alex, and Soyun. Okay, thank you very much, folks.